everybody, welcome back to the shop. This is part one of the video design series for Matter Than a Hatter. If you didn't watch the prequel, I suggest you do that first. You can click the link below. I'll try to explain everything so that you won't miss out if you don't watch it, but it gives you a good insight into how I start this process pretty much every time. I recorded the prequel video seven days ago, and I have done no development on the game since then. Even though I had my prototype on me every day, uh, I really didn't get a chance to sit down with it, and I wanted to record that time anyway. Keep in mind, this is just my process. This might not work for you. I tend to do things a little differently than most, so let me get the camera set up. We'll just get started. Okay. So first off, let's talk about the tools that are essential to my game design process. Obviously a prototype, which if you watch the video I have on me all the time, in this particular case, it's simple because it's only 36 cards. When I'm in a rapid session, when I'm sitting down to prototype and to sort out how this is going to work, my favorite thing is pen and paper. This is the fastest way for me to get thoughts from my head into some sort of tangible form that I won't lose then I can transfer those to my tablet or my laptop. My laptop, this is completely essential for my personal design process because I also do graphic design. Most people will tell you that graphic design shouldn't be a concern of yours when you're designing a game. And for most people, that's correct. You don't need to worry about it. Do a Google image search, grab some images, put them on your cards, done. The, the goal for you is to have a playable prototype, not a sellable product. In any creative process I've ever undertaken, whether it is writing, game design, woodworking, you hit roadblocks. You hit either bump that you don't have the skill yet to get over, or you hit a lull where you just can't figure out how to accomplish what it is you're looking for. And those can be really frustrating. And often in my process, I find that walking away from it for a while or going off and doing something else is a perfect way to just kind of let it go and let my you know, subconscious think about the problem and sort it out. So for me, graphic design is one of the ways I do that. If I'm hung up on the game mechanics, I can switch over to just drawing some icons or working on the game's logo and so I'm still working on the project. I'm working, you know, towards completion of the project, but I'm not stuck staring at my notes or staring at a non-functional prototype for hours trying to sort it out. This is what I wrote in the middle of the night. Now, I have not edited this since I first wrote it. So this is exactly what came off my head in the middle of the night. Anti-set collection semi-deduction. Okay. 36 cards for each of eight types of hat. So 32 hats will be in the game. Four special cards. Players are dealt three cards on your turn, play or pass. If everyone passes in a row, the game ends. If you play, you draw two. You must discard one and may play the other. To play a card, give it to an opponent face up. The hand ends when the deck runs out and you score no points for having a single card and one point for each duplicate card. I think the intention there was like if you had a pair, that was one point. Three of a kind would be uh, two points and so on. And you would be minus five points if you had all four of a type. So that was the shooting the moon that I talked about. If you could get all of them, that would be a good thing, right? Play until one player reaches X, lowest score wins. That's it. So those are the notes I took in the middle of the night. And you can tell they're very brief and not descriptive at all. So what do we know from this? Well, anti-set collection was the initial idea for the game. It was, I want to have a game where you're trying not to get sets of things. And semi-deduction, um, I don't honestly have any idea what my intention was when I wrote that. Other than my thought was, let's, we can talk about these jokers now, because I do have ideas for these jokers. So there's four cards in this deck that aren't a suit, that aren't a hat, they're just jokers, and they're going to do something. And so what I thought was each one of these would be a special power. So I have taken notes on that actually. So special cards could be, do not count one card. So let's say I, at the end of the round I have, I have two sevens. 
I could use my joker to get rid of one of those sevens, and now I have a single, and that's good, right? That's what we're trying to do, is not get pairs. Um, so that could be one of the jokers. Uh, the other one could be to take a card from the discard pile. That could be really good if you've got, if you were trying to shoot the moon and somebody discarded one trying to stick you and you had this card, you could get one out of the, out of the discard pile and make your set. One would let you take a face-up card into your hand. So my, my concept that night, you have this hand of cards, right? And you're trying not to get pairs. So you draw two cards, you have to discard a card. It doesn't have to be one of the ones you drew, by the way. It could be any card. So say I'll discard this. And then I may play one of these. And so playing one of these means uh, that I would give it to you. That would be playing in this original version. So I'd say I give you a three, and that's it. I could choose not to give you a card and just keep my hand. And so maybe that was a singleton that I picked up and I want to keep it because I don't want to score points, okay? But as I discussed in the prequel, this doesn't work. It's a completely broken system because there's no point in ever keeping cards in your hand. It's bad to have cards in your hand because that means that somebody can give you a card and it's a much higher likeliness that they paired you and you've lost points. So that's flawed right out of the gate. We don't even have to continue down that line of thought. But this is what I was maybe thinking, I, maybe this is what I was thinking about with the deduction was trying to figure out if you had a special card in your hand. Because I was going to shuffle these in the deck. I'm thinking I'm not going to shuffle these in the deck anymore. I'm thinking that I would like to have, and you'll get one and it's your unique special power to start the round. Everybody will have one, so that way it's even. Um, and I, I'm, I'm probably going to head that way. So. I, for right now, I'm going to I'm going to take that debt and I'm going to write it down, okay? Cuz this is this is how this works, right? Writing it down. So we've got special cards, special abilities. Deal one to each player at start. Okay? And for now, we're just going to say we have 4, so that limits us to a 4 player game. In order to really think this through, we don't need these right now, okay, at all. We're not even gonna draw them. So we've already modified this rule set. So I can pretty much set this tablet aside for right now because I'm just gonna be taking notes down here. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna shuffle up and we're gonna play a sample game. All right, so now that we know how the game was originally intended to be played, I'm going to now start playing with the ideas that I talked briefly about in the prequel, how to make this game actually functional. This is one of those problems that arises with simple games like this. It's actually very, very easy to make a simple game that's playable. I did it in the middle of the night. That game could be played. Is it any good? No. That's where the hard part comes in. Taking a stack of 36 cards, or 32 in this case, because we took out the Jokers, and turning this into a playable game that's also fun to play, that's the challenge. And that's what we're attempting to do here. I can't tell you that this is gonna succeed because I haven't pre-thought out anything. This game might flop completely to the point that I scrap it, but we're gonna make a darn good effort at trying and um, I'm open to any suggestions. If you see something that you think I should think about, please comment, tweet me, email me, however you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me and let me know, hey, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? And we'll try it. So what I'm gonna run with is three card hands. I really like the idea of a simple three card hand. I got three cards, so this guy drew a seven, a six, and a jack. And now he has to take his turn. No, there's no information currently. So he draws his two cards. And I drew an eight and a five. So actually I have nothing but singletons right now, which is actually really good. And I'm going to take notes here. I'm thinking maybe we should start with one face up as like a seed. I don't mind that idea. So both of these are pretty good, or so all of these are pretty good. I have to discard a card, so we know I don't care. I'll just discard a card. And then I have to play a card. In this version, what I'm thinking is 
I play a card to either you or me, and everything scores. I think in my original, um, my original thought process was that cards in your hand would score positively and cards on the table would score negatively. I want to scrap any math in this thing. I, I don't, I don't want to have that at all. It's just going to be a simple, did you get multiples or not? So what we're going to do, let's see, I've got, I have to play one of these cards. Now, what I'm thinking is I can't keep cards for myself, so I can't give myself a six. I have to give it to an opponent. So not knowing anything, I'm just going to give it to the guy who goes last. I don't know. So number two has a hand, a five, six, and an eight. So he has to draw two. And he drew a three and a four. So he also does not have any pairs. So he'll just pick one at random, he'll discard this five, and he's going to give, uh, he's going to, no, actually he's going to discard the six, telling everybody, this guy doesn't have the ability to shoot the moon right now, uh, because the sixes have been discarded. So, and now he's going to give this guy a five, we'll give it to the last place guy again. So this guy goes, he has a pair of tens and a three, we're going to draw, oh, he drew a three. Oh no, he drew two threes. All right, so what is this guy, what's his goal now? I think his goal is to get a three. That's, it is, I mean, he's got a pair of tens and a three. So we're going to discard a ten. We're going to give Mr. Six over here a ten, because we don't like him for whatever reason. Didn't get a three. All the tens are gone. Um, I'm wondering if this should be. This should, probably should be known information. I don't. I don't. I don't like giving people advantages just because they have better memory. So we know this ten safe. We might as well hold on to it. That's a safe card. And uh, yeah, but we gotta keep these threes. So we're gonna discard that ten, which probably gave some information away about our hand. We're going to give this guy a five. Everybody probably knows that I have a set now because I discarded a known point. Why would I throw away a card that I could not get hurt with? So, okay. So what do we got left? So these are our, these are our cards after we're done. Um, damn, if I had 20... Four cards left over, that would be 12, so we'd all get three turns. That makes me wonder if I should even have the special cards. I really want the special cards, Hoke. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking one of these special cards could be take any face-up card on the table. That's pretty cool, because then you could be tricky with it. You could give somebody something that makes your thing. So, abilities... Take one face up. Take one from discard. Don't count one. So two of these will give you the ability to shoot the moon if you want. Or just get you a point. Uh, Don't count one card helps you escape a trap, which is good. And we'll have to figure out what the last one does. Okay, but first I want to address how we're going to score. So in this situation, this guy has three singles and three of a kind. This guy has no pairs at all, which is really good. Three of a kind, four singles. This poor guy got stuck with a three of a kind and a pair of eights, so he's really hosed. So, I think I want positive scoring, which makes that decision of giving somebody a card kind of nerve-wracking, because I don't want to give you points. I want to try and figure out a way to stick you with points. Uh, 
I kind of liked how this guy had a set of threes in his hand and he was trying to get that third one and he was eight or that fourth one and he was able to hide his set of threes. That was kind of neat. If I had, if I only had a two card hand, it would be more difficult to try and get that fourth one. So that's, um, that's important. Don't count one card. What if I say don't count one suit? How strong would that be? That'd be too much, wouldn't it? If you shoot the moon and I just negate it, <laughs> how bad, how mad would you be? That would be miserable. I would hate that. So let's not do that. That that's just I don't like putting I don't like putting negativity in for the sake of putting negativity in. That's just kind of mean for the sake of being mean. I felt okay the way the round played out. I want the players to have more than two turns though. That really restricts how much you can interact with the cards and if we just draw one draw one play one so I draw a card, and then I have to give you a card. It can either be from my hand or the card I just drew. Um, there's never going to be a discard pile, which eliminates a lot of known information. All right, so let's sort out the math. Let's, let, let me think about this in my head, because I'm really not good at math in my head. I never have been. If we start off with three cards, with well, four cards instead of three, and we do... Uh, we'll do three down, one up, three down, one up, three down, one up, three down, one up. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Sixteen cards left, and if we do draw one, that means we'd all get four turns. That's not terrible. Uh, if this was a three-player game, I would have twenty cards left. And what do we do in that last round? Do we just play it out? We'd have to, right? I think we'd just have to play it out and the, and the deal passes. We each have a card face up now. I'll draw one, play one. Still trying to avoid pairs. We can see that sixes, nobody's going to shoot the moon there unless they have the special cards to do it. I think that's a direction to pursue for next episode. I think we're going to try to have a face-up card, which is basically a seed for the round. And then we'll have to draw a card, one card, play one card. It doesn't have to be the card you drew, obviously. It can be any of the four cards in your hand. There won't be a discard pile. Um... Yeah, no discard pile. I think that's important. Okay, that's enough for this first session. Um, what you saw was the very first complete run through of a hand. This is the first time I've gone all the way through the deck to see what would happen and what the outcome would be. Prior to that, I've just done minor thought experiments with how to play cards and whatnot. We've also designed the uh, first three of the four special cards, which I think are pretty good. I need to come up with the fourth one. Um, I don't want these to be so powerful, though, that you just kind of walk through the hand and don't have to worry because you've got the special ability to, to just negate all the work you just did. So what I like to do at this point is I like to take these notes, and I'll combine them with the notes I already have, and just start tweaking my rule set, even though right now it's 
basically back of the napkin rules. I'll start plugging this stuff in and typically as I go, uh, sometimes ideas open up as I'm writing those rules down and as I'm tweaking things. Like, oh, what if, what if I try this? What if I try that? And then the next time I come back to the cards, I'll have some new things to tweak with. And that's what we're going to do on the next episode. So Hey, thanks for watching episode one. Before we go, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the theme of this game. I told you in the prequel that I would explain why Matter of the Hatter fits this game really well. Uh, it's actually very simple. When I first had the idea for the game, it was going to be Happy Haberdasher. And the hat collectors were trying to get a collection of hats with only one of each style because you don't want multiple hats of the same style. And that's cute and all, but then why are we giving each other hats? Why would I give you a hat just because that doesn't make any sense? And so that bugged me and I almost scrapped it. Started thinking about other things that you only want to have one of. Some people gave me suggestions like wives or illnesses or children. And those are cute and funny and all that, but it doesn't really work for me. Um, I, st I still kept coming back to hats. And when this idea hit me, what if we were haberdashers, not customers? And we were trying to open our own store. And three other people in town had the exact same idea as us. And we all opened a hat store at the same time. So now we've got immediate competitors. And we're in a race to get the best selection of hats on our shelves. So we can attract the most customers. And that's why we don't want duplicates. We just want one of each hat. So we are simultaneously trying to build our stock with the best selection and we are sabotaging our opponents or our competition by putting hats on their shelves that aren't, aren't going to sell. But if you can get a monopoly on a type of hat, if you can shoot the moon and get all four, yeah, now we're in the money because now we have an exclusive. So that's how this theme drove the game. And even, like I said, in a simple game like this, there's no rules on the cards. There's no text. It's just a simple little card game. Uh, I'm still telling a story. I'm telling the story of a bunch of haberdashers opening a shop and, and getting upset and trying to stick their opponents with bad hats. It works. And that theme has helped me drive the mechanics forward and make sense out of what I'm trying to do. So... Thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for watching this episode. Uh, in the next episode, we'll go over uh, the next iteration, and uh, we might even try and tie the theme in a little more. Thanks.